Welcome students to exercise 8, which is going to be our introduction to the skeletal system. And we're actually going to start by reviewing the cartilages. Um, while most people think of the bones when they think of the skeleton, um, the cartilages are also a part of the skeletal system, um, and so it's helpful to just review them real quickly. Um, so let's remember that these are connective tissues, so they've got um, kind of cells and fibers sitting in an extracellular matrix. Um, they've got different fiber types, their extracellular matrices are slightly different, but we've got um, hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. That's our three cartilage types. The hyaline cartilage um, provides a very smooth surface, a lot of flexibility and support. It's got a lot of water in its extracellular matrix, so it's very kind of resilient. The elastic cartilage has cartilages have elastic fibers in them and so they're very springy uh, they rebound quite nicely because of the elastic fibers and then the fibrocartilage is the toughest of the cartilaginous tissues because it has very thick collagen fibers in it that provide a lot of tensile strength um, so if you were to kind of pull on a piece of fibrocartilage you would have a really hard time kind of tugging it apart because of the tensile strength inherent in the collagen fibers. Um, so the hyaline cartilage is the most abundant of our cartilages. It is uh, our costal cartilage connecting our ribs to our sternum. It's the nasal cartilage of our external nose there. It's our respiratory cartilage, um, so keeping our airways open um, in the trachea and the bronchi and the lungs, and then it makes up um, the larynx apparatus for our kind of speech processes. Um, that's all hyaline cartilage. Um, because hyaline cartilage does have kind of a glassy um, feel to it, it is also the articular cartilage. So we will find um, hyaline cartilage in all of our joints covering all of the surfaces of the bones that make joints. Elastic cartilage is the least abundant of the cartilaginous tissues. We find it only in two places, the external ear um, and then the epiglottis, which is the flap that closes over your airways so that food just go not, goes down your esophagus, down your GI tract, and, and not your airways. Um, and then the fibrocartilage is found um, where we put a lot of kind of shall we say, stress on our bones. Um, so the pubic symphysis here between the two pubic bones, the intervertebral discs between the vertebrae, and then the knee menisci between the thigh and the leg down here. All of those places are places where we put a lot of weight, we put a lot of stress on the skeleton, and it's very helpful to have big, thick pads of fibrocartilage there. So when we study the skeleton um, and the 206 bones therein, it is useful to break the skeleton into two divisions. If you tried to learn all 206 bones all at once, um, our brains would pretty much explode. But if we can break it into kind of pieces um, and groups to study, then um, we have to put it into kind of more manageable bites. Um, so we break the skeleton into what we call the axial skeleton, which are the bones that go along the long axis of the body, around the body's center of gravity. Um, so we're talking about the skull, the thoracic cage, and the vertebral column. And then the appendicular skeleton, right, appendicular appendages, are the bones of the limbs, as well as the bones that attach those limbs to the axial skeleton. And so we're talking about the pectoral girdle and the upper limb and the pelvic girdle and the lower limb. Um, so your lab manual breaks this into two chapters. Um, exercise nine is all about the axial skeleton and exercise 10 is all about the appendicular skeleton. When you cut open a bone, when you look inside a bone, um, one of the things that you will notice is that there are two kind of structural types to our bone, two different textures that look very different, um, both macroscopically um, and then microscopically. So we have spongy bone and compact bone. So you can see spongy bone here, compact bone here. This is a zoomed in view of the spongy bone. So when you all were looking at um, the osseous tissue as part of our look at tissues, you looked at something that looked kind of like tree rings. Um, what you were looking at then was the compact bone 
the spongy bone, when you look at it microscopically, will look very, very, very different. But both of those are still osseous tissue. Um, so the spongy bone is generally the inner portion of the bones. Um, it's very, very, very porous. Um, all of these empty spaces get filled actually with marrow. And what kind of organizes the spongy bone, what composes the spongy bone, are what are called trabeculae here. Um, and there are these pieces of bone that make this kind of honeycomb structure that we see with the spongy bone. Conversely, the compact bone is smoother looking, it's very rigid, it's the outer portions of the bones, and its kind of organizing structure is the osteon, which is those tree rings that you all were looking at um, when we looked at osseous tissue. Um, when we look at bones, we classify them by shape. It helps us to, uh, gives us a little indication um, about kind of what type, whether is it more compact, is it spongy, um, and just some overall um, information about the general shape of the bone. Now, we have four different classifications. We have long bones, irregular bones, flat bones, and short bones. Long bones are longer than they are wide, um, and they are more compact bone than spongy bone, and most of the limbs bones are long bones. Uh, the exception to that are the wrist bones and the ankle bones. They are short bones. Short bones are um, more spongy than compact, and they are roughly the same length as as they are with. So they're kind of boxy or cuboidal. We also have a special type of short bone called a sesamoid bone, um, and these are smaller bones often, um, but they're short bones that are found within joints. So the patella is an example of a sesamoid bone, and then there are some really tiny sesamoid bones here in the thumb. The flat bones are very, very thin. And I like to think of them as basically a sandwich of bone, where you've got the spongy bone in the middle, and then that's like the meat of your sandwich, and the like the bread of your sandwich is the compact bone. If I go back to that last image, something like this, right? So if you think of the compact bone as the bread, and the spongy bone as the meat of your sandwich. If you have a bone that then doesn't fit neatly into one of these three categories, either as a long bone, flat bone, or short bone, if it's got an odd shape like the vertebra here, then it is considered an irregular bone. The auditory ossicles, which are the tiny little bones inside your middle ear cavities that help you hear, are also a really good example of irregular bones. They have very, very odd shapes. They don't fit neatly into one of the other three categories, and so we lump all the kind of oddly shaped bones um, together and call them irregular bones. If we look at some of the gross anatomy of a long bone, you'll see that there's some terminology that we have to learn. Um, the middle portion of the bone is known as the diaphysis, that's the shaft of the bone. And the two ends where it gets a little expanded and is a little wider are known as the epiphyses. You have a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis. So the arm here is, uh, the bone here, excuse me, happens to be the arm, um, which is the humerus. So this is the end of the bone that would make your shoulder joint. This is the end of the bone that would make your elbow joint. In the middle of the diaphysis is a medullary cavity, which in um, infants and very, very young children will contain red marrow for what we call hematopoiesis, which is the production of our blood cells. And in older children, teens, and adults, the medullary cavity will hold yellow marrow, which is essentially just adipose tissue for fat storage, a uh, little extra energy storage there. The medullary cavity, as well as all of the trabeculae in the epiphyses, are lined by a very fine, thin membrane called an endosteum, and then the outer bone is then lined with a more fibrous periosteum. If we look at compact bone microscopically, we're back to the tree rings, right? So this is what I was talking about where it looks kind of like tree rings. Um, so the osteon that you're looking at here um, is often sometimes referred to as a haversian system for this central or haversian canal. The haversian canal allows blood vessels and nerves um, to kind of move through the bone. 
radiating out from the central canal are concentric lamellae. Lamellae is just a fancy word for layers. In each lamella, that is where we will find our little lacuna. Sitting in that lacuna will be an osteocyte. The osteocyte then kind of spreads out its arms and can communicate to other osteocytes in other lamellae through what we call cannuliculi, which is a word that means little canal. Um, so what looks sort of like little hairs here isn't actually hairs, it's these little canals, these little cannuliculi that the osteocytes can kind of send their arms through in order to communicate to one another. We also have perforating or Volksmann's canals that connect the central canals that again allow blood and, and um, oxygen and nutrients and nerves um, to kind of travel through the different bones. Around the whole of the bone, we will find circumferential lamellae around the circumference of the bone. And then what we will also find sometimes are what we call interstitial lamellae. And essentially, it's pieces of older osteons that have been recycled. Um, so part of the osteon has been recycled and you're just kind of seeing the remnants um, and that is interstitial lamellae. Um, one of the interesting things about compact bone is the collagen fibers in the compact bone will run in different directions in each lamella. So in one instance, the collagen fibers they might run in this direction, and then they're gonna run in this direction, and then they're gonna run in this direction. And that allows the compact bone to resist what we call torsion forces, which are like kind of twisting forces. Um, it's a nice kind of added oomph uh, in terms of the structural integrity of our bones. If we look at spongy bone microscopically, you'll see that it looks very, very different. It's much more porous. There are no more osteons. Instead, what we have are the trabeculae, which are those kind of pieces of bone that make up the, the honeycomb. You'll also see um, this more kind of unformed, unstructured tissue. Um, I kind of think it looks like cotton candy. Um, it is red marrow. So all of the places where we find spongy bone, we will also find red marrow um, for hematopoiesis, the production of our blood cells. So compact bone has kind of the alternating arrangement of the collagen fibers to give it strength. Um, what spongy bone helps um, has going for it is the arrangement of the trabeculae. Very often the trabeculae will lay along our stress points on our bone um, to help kind of resist some of that stressors um, like um, a, a bridge truss kind of holding up a bridge or, or the trusses in a roof holding up uh, like the roof of a house. Um, so both the spongy bone and the compact bone um, have elements to them um, that help them um, remain uh, resilient and strong. The last little bit of gross anatomy in exercise eight happens to deal with what we call bone markings and table 8.1. Our bones are not formless. They've got projections that stick out past them. They've got ridges and they've got grooves and holes and um, weird shapes that come together. All of these markings play a role in how the skeleton functions, either how it comes together, how muscles attach, um, maybe a way for blood vessels and nerves to uh, move around the body through the bones. Um, and I always recommend to my students that they start here with table 8.1. The reason it is helpful to start with table 8.1 is that before you even look at all of the bone markings that we're going to ask you to know, if you know, for instance, that a foramen is a round or oval opening, it's basically a hole, then every time you see the word foramen, you know that you're talking about a hole or holes if we talk about foramina, which is the plural version of that word. If you know that a condyle is a rounded articular projection, then every time you see the word condyle, the trochlear condyle, the lateral condyle of the femur, the medial condyle of the tibia, um, then you know that it's this kind of rounded kind of projection that's going to make a joint. Um, 
And so before you even look at all of the individual bone markings, um, it helps to have an idea of kind of what the general shape and what the general function of these things are um, just by reviewing table 8.1 here. The last little bit of exercise eight has to deal with um, how we grow, right? So um, embryonically, our skeletons, with the exception of our skull, are cartilaginous tissues. Our, our skull actually starts off as kind of membranes. Um, but when we are born, some of that kind of embryonic cartilage remains as what we call the epiphyseal plate. And this is our growth plates. This is how we get taller. And essentially what we do is we form new cartilage closer to the epiphysis, kind of on this side of the plate. And that pushes the epiphysis away from the diaphysis. And then the older cartilage kind of dies off and is replaced by bone tissue. And so we're, we're kind of constantly making new cartilage, replacing old cartilage with bone, making new cartilage, replacing old cartilage with bone. And that is what lengthens our bones throughout childhood. When you look at the epiphyseal plate, you'll notice several different zones within the plate. The zone closest to the epiphysis is the resting zone, where pretty much not much is going on. It's pretty much just cartilage being cartilage. In the proliferation zone, you'll see lots of really tightly packed cartilage cells because this is what's this is where the cartilage cells are going through mitosis. They're making copies of themselves, and that's why you see so many of them here in the proliferation zone. Well, as new cartilage cells are made, the older cartilage cells um, become very, very large, so that we call that the hypertrophic zone. As we descend closer to the diaphysis, or ascend closer to the diaphysis if we were on the other epiphysis, um, then the calcium the calcification zone is where the cartilage cells start to die off. They start to attract calcium crystals in, and incorporate those calcium crystals into their extracellular matrix. And it starts to look more like bone tissue, although it is still not bone tissue. It's still just calcified cartilage. And then in the zone closest to the diaphysis, that is where we have ossification occurring, where we actually have new osseous tissue forming. Um, that is essentially replacing the dead calcified cartilage. So we grow cartilage here in the proliferation zone that pushes the epiphysis away from the diaphysis and the older cartilage is replaced by bone tissue in the ossification zone and that then solidifies the growth that we have achieved.